I can't guarantee. Uh, we can't guarantee you who's going to be alive in two weeks when this draft starts. We've got a 49ers draft roundtable. Jason Aponte, Steph Chan- Sanchez talking wide milk, hypers mocking who to the Niners, and what this draft strategy is for San Francisco coming at you right now. All right, thanks everybody for jumping in live over time with Brian Peacock, brand new channel. I got to ask everybody, hit that subscribe button, trying to get that first 1,000 subscribers here. Uh, we launched last week. Overtime, it's OT because it goes off topic. OT because sometimes I don't have time for everything I want to do on Locked On 49ers. Daily on the Locked On Podcast Network, me and Croc talking it up. Um, Croc talks a lot, so you know sometimes uh, th- there's not enough time to get into what I want to get into, and sometimes we don't have enough time to get into some of the guests and and talk 49ers football with folks like Steph Sanchez at Steph 49K, Jason Aponte at Jason Aponte, whole bunch of numbers on Twitter. <laughs> um, I'm excited to get into this conversation. Uh, appreciate you guys jumping in here, uh, and yeah, hit that subscribe button, hit the the like button, come join me often here on OT with BP having fun on this new channel. It's a loose channel. There's no rules here. And we're even, we're simulcasting this thing, right guys? I think it's the first time I've done the old simulcast. Tell the folks where they can find your stuff. Um, I'm at Steph 49 K pretty much every social media platform. Well, not every, but you know, the big ones, Instagram, Twitter, uh, you know, TikTok. you find the Nick Bosa impersonations there. So that's where you can find me. Yeah, and uh, Jason Aponte, it's really easy on on YouTube. And make sure you guys subscribe to to my guy Brian's uh, Brian's new channel, man. You know you guys are going to love it, and you know that he does such good work. So make sure you guys do that. I was going to say, I feel, I feel like I'm on a radio show here. Like, yeah. hi, Mom. <laughs> like, when that intro, that was fire. I like it. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Look, I had to throw some rock and roll. That was actually my old intro <laughs> before we, uh, you know, went big time on on my old my other podcast. Uh, and uh, it's a it's a, a just little rock and roll vibe. Get the get the mood right before we get into to some of these conversations here. Um, I, I think we got. By the way, I just want to say Steph's probably best hair in 49ers content creation media land. Aponte maybe second. And I'm disappointed. He's got the flip lid, no hair, because I actually got a haircut yesterday because I didn't want to come in here with the hat and be some schlub because I knew who my guests were going to be. And the the big-time game that was going to be on the screen with me, and I, I can't compete there, but I, I wanted to at least not go hat, which I usually do nine times out of ten on the pod. So appreciate you for screwing that up, Aponte. Yeah, I mean, leave it, leave it to me to to you know not get the memo. But honestly, I'm just I'm just waiting before I leave to go to the draft to get a haircut. I think it's a little bit better uh, to to wait a little bit longer. Plus, inflation's real, man. This fifty dollar haircut thing a week thing, it, it's it's not gonna fly. I, I I just don't know how I'm gonna keep this up. That is rough. Yeah, yeah. that's why I'm not much of a I, I don't do I'm not big on the grooming. You know, throw a hat on. Let's go. Uh, let's get out the door and 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 start the day. Uh, I actually want to lead with you Aponte, because you were on with uh on the conference call with Mel Kuyper right the the NFL draft conference call talking about his latest mock draft and why he had who he had to the San Francisco 49ers for those of you who did not see it was a two round mock draft he had Washington right tackle Roger Rosengarten going to the 49ers at pick 31 in the second round Andrew Phillips a corner out of the University of Kentucky and what kind of intel did you get from Mel Kuyper on his mock draft so essentially, everyone's going to ask what the thought process is with him. But for me, it felt like in his description, in his mock draft, it talks about how he doesn't allow any sacks in 1,158 pass blocking snaps. But it really le- it ends with he has familiarity with San Francisco star Christian McCaffrey's dad. And then we find out that he's working out with Joe Staley. So what I asked was, I just wanted to know, if are you hearing something? Are you reading tea leaves? Or is this really a fit? And essentially, he says that, you know, they can look to upgrade at the spot at right tackle, but he really likes the kid. Um, 6'5", 308, 492, and a 30 vertical. Um, numbers don't mean a heck of a lot. He said he remembers Jason Fabini ran like a 5'5", five, five, heck of a career. And he said that it was more about the type of athlete that he was. But he also went on to explain that he believes 
that Rosengarten isn't somebody, a candidate to flip over to left tackle, that he has to stay primarily a right tackle. He doesn't see the skill set for him to go over there. But kind of like how you and I were talking off of line, like before we started, this one really doesn't feel like something that he's watching film and saying that fits. It really just feels like something that he's hearing. And that's kind of what I was trying to poke at. But he's too good at media to give that right away. Yeah. And look, Steph, you, you've you been sort of in charge of keeping track of what the 49ers are doing and what they're working on behind the scenes. You know, like you have this amazing ability to know who all the scouts are. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's the dude from uh th that's a dude with this title and he's over here at this school while this dude with this title is over here at this school and you can pick him out from a photograph or from a, a quick video of some of these pro days and stuff and when it comes to Mel Kuyper's mock and with what's going on with the 49ers and how they really trust certain coaches to give them the right information how they trust certain people you know it was uh, Arizona State it was South Carolina and they go back to the well and you know they trust family there there's a there's some nepotism going on in the building right there's kubiaks and there's shanahan's and there's mccaffrey's and um do you put any credence into the joe staley thing with roger rosengarten do you put any credence into the the ed mccaffrey coaching him in high school thing as far as maybe even drafting him high over drafting him or even going down the rabbit hole of brandon rice luke mccaffrey frank gore jr as prospects for the 49ers I'm not as heavy on the, you know, legacy draft picks for the 49ers as maybe other fans are, but this one might have legs. I, I would say that last year, you know, Matthew Bergeron was someone who Joe Staley, um, you know, worked out with or was training with. And I felt like there was some connection with the 49ers there. You know, they had met with him, I believe at the combine last year. So I kind of thought that would be a thing. But this year, I haven't heard anything about Rosengarten, you know, being connected to the 49ers in any way. Now, that doesn't mean that there hasn't been any contact throughout this process. That just means there hasn't been any reports. So it could mean they're keeping some things very close to the vest, which usually could indicate some interest, right? I mean, <laughs> the, yeah. the 49ers do like to move in silence. I do always say, like, the, the 30 visits do give a pretty decent indication of like who they're interested in in the draft. Um, so once those get rolling, uh, we'll maybe know a little bit more if Rosengarten is included in that. But, you know, this this could be something they're trying to keep under wraps for a reason. And I know, uh, you know, currently Rosengarten is probably like a day two kind of guy. Um, as far as, you know, reaching for someone, the 49ers have shown if they like someone – they, they don't care about anyone else's value. They go by what how they value that player. And if that means reaching by the media standards, they they do not care. So if, if Rosengarten is that kind of guy, they would have no problem doing that, I think. Yeah, and you mentioned 30 visits, and I, I want to get a little deeper into that in a second because I know you're keeping track. But it's interesting because the last time the 49ers drafted a tackle in the first round, they didn't show any interest. And they were trying to throw people off on Mike McGlinchey. There was no 30 visit. There was no, I don't, I think they might've like not even sent anybody to the pro day or something crazy like that. Right. Like they, they went as far away from him as possible before the draft. And then there was that overnight trade and they shipped off Trent Williams after that pick of Mike McGlinchey as the future right tackle for the team. So maybe it's one of those, but in recent years, Steph, you just kind of talked about it. There's been a, a lot of correlation with the guys that they brought in on those 30 visits to who they've actually drafted. Yeah, there, there has been, but you make a good point. Like, I don't think, I don't believe the 49ers had anyone at Trey Lance's pro day, right? Like, if I'm remembering correctly. So, I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, but that was such a weird, they, that was COVID off season. And yeah. like, apparently they met with him like a hundred times on Zoom. And <laughs> yeah, that was uh, a, that was a whole, really weird. That was a really weird. Was strange and screwed up. And that, they were drawing uh, up plays with Mac Jones on, on the plane after, right? Whatever the hell. Uh, it was, yeah, it was, it was whatever it was, was happening on that on that plane. It was literally, but the, you know, I <laughs> there was too much time on everyone's hands. They talked themselves into something. It was the one offseason you probably don't want to go spend an, a million draft picks because everything was incomplete that offseason. Yeah, yeah, and and basically what I was gonna say is that you know I almost feel like the 49ers tried to conceal who they're interested in so much that it kind of tells you who they might be interested in. But then at the same time, there's so many prospects in the draft that it, it's really hard to say. But, 
you know, sometimes there, there's some where, hmm, it's a little suspicious. We haven't heard that they have interest in this guy. Uh, there's It's suspicious that to this point, there's only been one reported offensive lineman who has a 30 visit with 49ers, right? And that's Caden Wallace. Um, given that it's a pretty significant need, uh, we would say, for the 49ers, I'd say. No doubt. That's a huge need for the 49ers. So if they're not if they're not doing 30 visits with offensive linemen, um, and I think one of the biggest things you can tell, and not just from the 30 visits, but you know, prospect visits and the the combine stuff and the the pro days and all that, the the big one in, in last year, it was it was pretty clear. It was like they were they were meeting with every tight end, and you you knew they were interested in tight ends, you knew it was a need. And it, they they made it pretty obvious they would they were doing all their due diligence on all the tight ends and they ended up drafting two of the guys, um, and, and so you know I think linebacker was one of those last year it was really clear. So from what you've been able to gather, and you are the foremost expert on this, what what positions are they looking at the most in this draft? I definitely think secondary is is something that the 49ers are are definitely looking at a decent number of corners. Uh, they still can't stay away from defensive linemen. Like <laughs> that is still very much something they're they're always doing their due diligence on a number of different guys. And you know, you you mentioned the combine. That was probably where we did see the most indication that the 49ers, you know, did talk to a lot of offensive linemen there. Um, there just hasn't been anything after that to indicate. So um, yeah, I would say those are probably the big ones. And then also wide receiver um, is another position that I think, uh, you know, the 49ers is definitely going to look to target in this draft. Now, one position that, you know, people are kind of seen as a need these days is tight end. And I would say based on who I've seen them have reported interest in this draft process, there hasn't been a lot of of the high end tight ends like that you would think, but then again, this isn't a very strong tight end class. So based on that, I kind of think they would go tight end in the later rounds if I had a guess, but again, maybe, maybe they're just uh, trying to, you know, steer us away from thinking they'll take tight end early. It kind of adds up because uh, Aponte, this is what I was going to go to next. And that ties in perfectly because they've been looking at these, uh, you know, there's, they're short term contracts. So you're not going to change your entire course of your franchise because you sign Eric Sauber to a one year deal, or, you know, they tried to, they signed the offer sheet with the uh, Brock Wright from Detroit, but it does feel like they're, they're signing guys because they're planning not to draft them early. That's what it feels like with tight end. And it's starting to feel that way at cornerback now. And maybe after all this interest and all the work they've been doing at corner, they found out, man, maybe we don't like the corners that much. And the two guys we like are not going to be there for us in the first round. And maybe we've got other plans. And so the guys we like aren't going to be there for us. So we're going to go get Isaac Yedem. They signed Rakia Sin today. Uh, Aponte, am I crazy for thinking that it's less likely that they're going to be targeting tight end and cornerback early in this draft? No, I don't think it's crazy at all. I do think that they've actually looked into it. And and this has kind of been the, the way that I've been looking at the Brandon Staley, Nick Sorensen thing. And even when they were going through their defensive coordinator search, everyone that was a candidate was a secondary guy. So it feels like there's a bit of a philosophy change coming where they want to prioritize corners and coverage a little bit more. But initially, when you dive into these guys, you start to think, OK, let's identify one in the draft. But then you go through the process and you're probably like, uh, you know, I feel a little bit more safe if we bring in a steady guy like Rocky Sin and, and, you know, Yidium and it can keep Lenore in the slot. I think that's really the crux of what they're trying to do is to try to keep Lenore in the slot because he's performed very well there and improved so much. Um, I think where we'll see something maybe is maybe not cornerback safety. And and I think that's kind of where the, the crux of the whole, well, you know, they're looking at black men and Justin Simmons is there. What about Hufanga, right? Like the, the problem is, and, and, you know, Steph and I talk about this all the time is trying to win with impact players that are cheap and you've got to try to find those in the draft. So if you can find a guy, cause it, you know, se certainly seems like Deshaun Gibson is not going to be there. Jair Brown seems to be slotted in as a starter, but what do you feel about Hufanga? What if, about if you have to pay him? So I think that's kind of where we are. I, I wouldn't be shocked if they went with a safety in this draft at all. Um, and then with, with the tight end thing, you know, Charlie Warner leaves and obviously he's a blocking tight end, but them consistently being tied to other tight ends, 
I think more says what they think about Braden Willis and Cam Laudu. And obviously, right, like it's a little bit early with Cam Laudu because he hasn't taken a snap or anything like that. But we had all heard the, the whispers about the drops um, and, and the way he was kind of struggling. But I wouldn't be shocked if the 49ers, you know, double back at the end of this draft and try to get a tight end as well, too. So I think it's like twofold. I think they're definitely in the market to find someone who can replace Warner. But I also think that they're telling you what they feel about Cam Lado and Braden Willis going into this season as well, too, that, you know, maybe they're not out on them, but they're not as confident that they'll take the leap that people think they will. It's a good point here by Invader 49er. The 49ers haven't put high in draft resources and really as far as money, they did sign Jimmy Ward and then they brought in Charvarius Ward, but uh, especially at safety. And look, I trust John Lynch with safety like he. He's nailed it every single time. They've had good safety play no matter what they've done there, and they haven't put tons of dollars and resources in. And, and maybe that's the plan is just to kind of keep filtering in rookie contract players and, and short-term, cheaper veterans if the market allows it. Um, so I, I it, maybe we shouldn't expect defensive backs to be a high priority in the draft for the 49ers. I think it's fair. And again, Rocky Sin was very solid last season in limited snaps with the with the Baltimore Ravens. Had a high draft grade when he was coming out. And and I think they're betting on Gideon possibly duplicating what he did last season with the Saints on the outside. More that more that that's not going to be the exception in his career, that maybe he's found something. And then again, when you pair that with Sorensen being a secondary guy, having played secondary in the NFC and uh, in the NFL, and then Staley with being so good with the two high looks and being able to, to craft a game plan for, for secondary. I think it all kind of lines up for, for them to think that they, they might have found something in Yidium. And here's the thing is like the room's starting to get pretty full. Like you got half a dozen corners, but pre-draft, they drafted Daryl Luter in the fifth round last year, outside corner, Ambry Thomas, outside corner, Sam Womack, fifth rounder, looked really good as a rookie, and then all of a sudden disappeared, you know, got doghoused, it looks like, and, and maybe they didn't like what they saw from him in the slot. And Richard Sherman said that maybe they thought he thought it was probably, you know, uh, his run support didn't really work great at nickel. So now he's an outside guy. Then they signed Isaac Yidam, outside corner. Rocky Sin, outside corner. Gentleman over the north is the nickel, period, right? Like, that's what they're doing. It, 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 how, how could that not be the plan right now? And it, it, if that's the plan, then they're pretty full at outside cornerback right now with, with the numbers they have going into camp. So, uh, or at least going into the draft and, and potentially OTAs. And um, again, those aren't get them and, and rock you sin, you cut them tomorrow, right? Those aren't long-term deals. Those aren't big money deals, but they're, they're up to something pre-draft. And if you read between the lines, uh, it really feels like corner and, tight end are those positions they're just trying to get set they did a lot of work on defense defensive line spending some money on a, on a couple of ends leonard floyd Vitor gross matos shadow 49er liked him coming out hasn't really developed into the guy i hoped he would be as far as a pass rusher off the end but really fits the prototype of a long big end that can come in and rush from the interior at points in the draft tells me that they're gearing up to draft an offensive lineman essentially at 31. I don't know if it's Roger Rosengarten, but I'd be shocked at this point if they, if if that's not the plan. And it really does feel like the plan maybe could be a D-tackle, could still be a defensive lineman. You should never take that off the board at all for the San Francisco 49ers. So that, that's, that's the vibe I'm getting with all this, with what the 49ers are doing. Um, Steph, throughout this process, have you found – a prospect that you love for the San Francisco 49ers? Is there a certain draft strategy you, you like for the 49ers early on in the draft as, as sort of like, here's the playbook if I'm John Lynch going into this thing in a couple of weeks? I like them going best player available. So I, and, and another way to look at all the moves they've made and, and how they've kind of, you know, cover their ass. You, you can say with defensive line, with the secondary, or in particular the corners. Um, I, I think that sets them up for best player available. Now, if the best player available on the board is an offensive lineman, you know, hell yeah, like let's get them. Uh, but I also think they, they wouldn't be afraid to, you know, take a corner if, you know, Cooper Day Jean or, uh, McKinstry was there right at 31 or even it close enough in their range. Right. Like, because we we're just talking about corners, but maybe it's not that big a need this year, but then you look at 2025 and it, 
it's a huge need. So it's it's a bigger need for 2025 than it is for 2024. But we talk about how important this draft is, not just for this season, but like, you know, your foundation for the turnover, basically. And so if you can get a foundational piece at 31, you got to go for it. So no matter what the position is. So I, I hope they go best player available, honestly, with with that first pick at 31. And then, you know, just let the draft kind of come to you. Um, I, you know, I feel like the 49ers do reach a lot with uh, certain certain positions, certain, certain players that maybe the consensus, um, you know, isn't really high on. Uh, you know, sometimes it has worked for them. Sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but I guess I would. I just want them to go for the sh- most sure thing they can find in this draft. I'm with you, man. Best player available, and it feels like one of the big reasons why they've been so good in later rounds and not as good in the earlier rounds of the draft. You know, Nick Bosa and Brandon Ayuk aside, is because they're kind of chasing need, and th- that's not a good strategy early in the NFL draft is to draft for need. And then when they go later in the draft and they're just drafting people who are wired and think they're they play the style of football that they want 49ers to play, then they've started hitting on those guys. And even those late third round picks and the 49ers again have number 94 in this draft. A lot of those picks have been, you know, there's been the running backs and they're like, oh, we need to be a bigger, we need to have bigger running backs. And it turns out, no, actually those, the more explosive running backs are the guys, they're the, the ones that are working out for you, Kyle. So stay there uh, with your running back game. And then the, you know, uh, Amory Thomas worked out really well. Um, Tarverius Moore, was like a height, weight, speed guy. So they've kind of tried to hit the height, weight, speed home run late in the third round as well. And that hasn't worked out great for them. So I don't know what the answer is, Jason, but how do you see this thing? What, what's your what's your strategy overall for the 49ers early in this draft? I always love best player available, right? You know, when you, when you try to plug a hole after trading DeForest Buckner for a high pick and you go and you go with a defensive tackle and you allow the Tampa Bay Bucks to jump you for... Tristan Wirfs, you start to lose out on these players that could be filling in holes and everything. But I have a tough time not thinking that it's going to be Jordan Morgan um, from Arizona. And I understand, you know, we love buzzwords during the draft process. Short arms, they scare you to death. I mean, for God's sakes, uh, Brian, the guy's got T-Rex arms. He'll never succeed in this league and ever be a starter. Like that short arms thing, he has like a quarter of an inch or three quarters of an inch shorter arms than like the guy that you really want to have. But I think Jordan Morgan starts to become more and more of a guy that you look at that'll end up being a starter and doesn't have to be somebody that you throw the expectations of a Mike McGlinchey on when you take him with the number nine pick. So if Jordan Morgan turns out to be a seven or eight year starter, not a guy who's an all pro, but he's a starter and he's very solid. And then you have Cole McKivis to kind of hang around the background just in case he doesn't develop. You still have somebody who's actually played a lot of snaps, who can actually play guard, who can actually play left tackle in a pinch. Um, I'm starting to think more and more that Jordan Morgan is the guy that they're actually looking at because I start to think that Amarius Mims is too big of a risk for them. Um, I think that's too like that one. That one is like the swing. That's a literally a home run or a strikeout. Like I don't see any middle part with him. Like it's either going to be that he's going to be this physically gifted freak or he's just going to be a guy who becomes unplayable. And I don't know if the 49ers can try that again in the first round with any type of player. Then you look at, you know, the kid from BYU, all those guys are going to be gone, I think, eventually, right? Um, So I do think that it ends up being Jordan Morgan at 31. That's the, the guy that I keep mocking to them um, as, I, as I go through the first round. When it comes to arm length, I've I've come full circle on that. It's 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 pretty wild. So uh, Jordan Morgan is 32 and 7 eighths or something like that. So just mm-hmm. you know, an eighth of an inch under 33 inches. There's, I think either zero or one starting offensive tackles in the NFL currently that are under 33 inches. And back in the day, people made a lot of, you know, remember it's like the Alex Smith big hand or small hands thing. And it was like, come on, hand size, arm length. What are we even doing here in the NFL draft? Uh, I remember reading old draft reports talking about guys talking about uh, bubble butts, you know, for defensive linemen. It's like, what? It's kind of creepy. What's going on right now? And the <laughs> more I do this, the more it's like, dang, you need that power. You need that. That base, you do need that bubble if you're going to be rooting people out. You need that leverage. It's important. You need to be able to get your hands on the guy in front of you before he can get his hands on you. You need big, strong hands. And then you see prospects like 
Darius Robinson, 35 inch arms, big, strong hands, controlling the, the offensive lineman in front of him, disengaging. And it's really important. And when it comes to offensive tackles, the league believes it's important. And there's been so many prospects and it's just time and time and time again, straight to guard. And, and I do think in the NFL, Jordan Morgan goes straight to guard. As good as this tape looks, as smooth as he looks at tackle, it's for some teams, and I think for most teams, it's just a non-starter. You're, you're sub 33-inch arms. You're not playing tackle for us. We saw it with Skaronsky last year. He's the best offensive lineman in the draft. Straight to guard. Not even like, let's see a fail at tackle first. So um, that's, that's an interesting one. And when you start to get late in round one at pick 31, you start seeing Roger Rosengarten, 33 and a half, by the way, which, so he's still like, he's, he's, he's acceptable. There's some guys with 33 and a half, but there's not many. Most of the, the offensive linemen in the NFL, their starting tackles are 34 or, or more. And that's kind of the cutoff that a lot of teams want. And there's some 33s out there, but you've got to have some really good ability, some special ability otherwise to, uh, for a team to even allow you to try to play tackle at this point in the NFL, which is, which is pretty wild. Um, that's why I keep settling on uh, Suamata Ia out of BYU, just because he hits all of those. And look, he's not as clean of a of a he's not that as finished of a pro- prospect as Jordan Morgan is right now. And uh, Niner Fanatic Pod in the uh, in the chat says, "Does Kingsley Suamata Ia go before thirty one? I don't think he does. It's possible because of that very reason because." Uh, what I was getting at at pick 31, it's like, okay, you're either going to get a guy who played college tackle, but gosh, you know, teams don't want, he's, he's not going to stick there. So now you're looking at an interior guy. You're looking at Barton, you're looking at Morgan. Um, or maybe it's a guy like a Mary's Mims who teams just don't know what the heck to do with him. You're not going to get a super clean starting day one offensive tackle, most likely at pick 31 most years. Maybe this year is a deep enough class where a guy gets close and you maybe you trade up, or maybe somebody is there at 31, but that's kind of what we're looking at with all these prospects. And I keep coming back to Suomata Ia because every time you go through it, it's like, man, he does have the long arms and the big hands and strong hands. And he's got the athleticism, but you know, third year sophomore, he's, he's he just turned 21 years old. He's just a pup, but has experience one year starting left tackle, one year starting right tackle. And you can see the, the, the tools he has tools to be a starting offensive tackle. And he's got some work to do. So there's some boomer bust there. And so, you know, once and, and Mims, I, I agree with you, Jason, by the way. Amirius Mims, if he's at 31, you have to take him. But I hope he's gone before that so the Niners don't have to take him because he scares the crap <laughs> out of me with that bust potential because eight games, you know, injuries, injured again at the combine. Uh, it's, it's a bad combination, and teams are so tackle needy. But, man, he looks good at 6'7 and 340 pounds. You're not supposed to move like that and, and wear 340 pounds that well. And, um like, look, Aponte knows that we got some size on this podcast. Steph, I don't know how tall you are. I've stood next I'm the, to you. I am the Jordan Morgan of, <laughs> of the show today. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Shorter arms for Steph. Uh, I'm, I'm about 34. I think I would pass there. I'm a little light in, in the pants to be able to, uh, to play offensive line. Uh, I did measure myself, though, during the combine this year, 6041. So 64 and an eighth. And I think Aponte is right around that area, 65 if you count the hair. So, yes. um, but like, it's, it's so, it's so hard to find human beings that are as tall as Aponte or I or taller and 100 pounds heavier and athletic. Right. Like, you don't see them walking around Target. You don't go to the grocery store and see them. You go around the grocery store, you see guys that are built like running backs and safeties. You just don't see offensive tackles with all the requisite length and, and size and athleticism that you need. And so that's kind of why I like Suomasi. Yeah, I, I, I see a lot of people, you know, mocking him more in the second round range. And, and Kuiper actually had him the last pick in the second round. I'd prefer Suomasi over Rosengarten myself, but I'm kind of, you know, betting on upside there with Suomasi, who, by the way, is um, Penny Sewell's cousin. And their athletic testing is identical. It's wild. Same height, same arm length, same hand size, 31 versus 30 bench press reps, natural strength in that family. Sumatia ran a tick faster in the 40 yard dash. So, you know, I'm hoping you can squint and see a right tackle that looks something like, like Pene Sewell. That's why Suomata E is my guy. And I'm kind of, I'm, I'm hoping for a tackle because there's a ton of good interior guys. It's a deep class. You can find a guard, you can find a center. 
I'm really trying to find a tackle at 31. So that's why I could see maybe you artificially push Rosengarten up. Uh, but for me, uh, my, my guy is Sue Amatia for that reason. And, you know, maybe even a trade back would make sense or a trade up, guys. And, and I want to answer ask that question next. Steph, what, what do you think? Is this, a, is this a trade up draft? Is it a trade down and then trade up later? Is it a trade up multiple times? Is it a collect picks? Because what you said about cost control players is really important. The four, it, it, We didn't see the, the Trey Lance draft picks. We didn't miss those immediately. You start to miss those two, three years after the picks happen, which is coming up now, coming up in the next couple of years. The 49ers need players at positions that start at positions that get paid a lot in the NFL. Offensive tackle being one of those, you know, defensive ends. The 49ers can't stay expensive everywhere, especially if they have to start paying an expensive quarterback. Um, so is it just – is maybe trade down – the plan to collect the most amount of picks and have the most dart throws and try to to build the depth back up on this football team. Are you going up? Are you going down? What's what do you think the 49ers should do there? Do you you like to stand pat at 31? Um, I mean, I definitely look if, if they're looking to get like a, a day one starting or at least a day one competing uh tackle, then I kind of think they would need to trade up to get a sure thing. Um but I think they would have to trade up, you know, to into the early 20s, maybe even the teens. And then at that point, you know, you're giving up a lot of draft capital to be able to do that. I don't know if that's necessarily worth it. Again, I like staying pat, take best player available at 31. I do entertain the idea of trading back, though, especially given the fact that uh, Suamataya has been – the closer we get into the draft, I feel like he's more seen as a second round guy. And I, I saw that uh, Dane Brugler had him as a second round grade as well. So then I'd feel a little more confident that you could trade back and still be able to get him. And that would be a really great uh, pool, you know, in the, in the second round. So, you know, that, that could be something because, I mean, especially at 31, there's probably going to be some teams that are trying to get into the, you know, leap teams that are in the early going of the second round. And so I'm sure the 49ers are going to get a lot of calls there. Um, so they might be tempted and still feel confident enough that they could get their guy and, and get a decent enough tackle um, by still trading back. So I wouldn't be mad at it. Um, but, you know, I think the for some reason, the most likely thing I could see happening is them just staying pat. The quarterbacks is interesting, too. It, it kind of goes along the lines of Amarius Mims and some other prospects. Cooper DeGene, I'm not as high on as other people are for the 49ers. I like him. I just think he's an inside player more than a, a pure outside corner, which is totally fine as well. But I kind of hope a, a team before the 49ers picks him pushes someone else back. I hope someone else picks a Mims and pushes somebody else back. I kind of hope a quarterback or two goes before the 49ers or someone wants to trade up with the 49ers at 31 to get one of those quarterbacks, you know, and, and maybe push somebody else back or give the 49ers a little boost there with some some added inventory and then maybe go up again later. Uh, Ponty, how do you see this thing? You, you're going up in this draft? you going down in this draft? I totally agree with you, Steph, that um, – if, if they're trying to find the like, especially if it's like, okay, we need a, we want a guy who's going to compete week one, starting right tackle. You probably got to go up and get your guy. Yeah. And the thing is, you're not going to be able to sign all these picks that you have, right? I mean, it's 10, 11, probably, you're probably not going to have enough spot space on the roster anyway. So what do you do? You know, you, you probably use this for ammunition to move up, but it has to be for someone that they're, they're so sure on that they know is going to be a player, right? And and what does that line up with? Is it a Kool-Aid McKinstry that you know that you have a very good chance of just putting him out there and starting him? And again, the the signing of Rocky Hassan and and Yidim, it, it doesn't mean that they'll be on the roster, you know, uh, of the 53. So that's not necessarily something that's going to stop them from, from getting there. But it has to be someone that they're absolutely sure about. And who knows? Is there a philosophy change with this team and they really want secondary and you find out that Kool-Aid's falling because – of the injury and the, and the whispers at the combine about effort and all that stuff, which Deion Sanders kind of blew up today about people throwing out misinformation to tank everybody's draft stock and things like that. That's, that's just, at this point, it feels more like the 49ers have more ammunition than ever to move up because you're not going to sign all of these picks that you have as well too. And it's not like you can just put them in a G league or something like that. So I think 
when you load up on all these comp picks, when you're continuing to get them over and over, why not in the first round look at how the board goes? And Brian, I think you said it, you know, the last time that we spoke when you were on my show, everybody has a, a target in the draft and everybody thinks the draft's going to come out whatever way they do. Right. So the 49ers may have an offensive tackle in mind, but they also have Colt McKibbis to fall back on and they still have all those guys just in case it doesn't play out. But there's always somebody who's going to throw a monkey wrench into something where they're going to take somebody way too early. The board gets completely out of whack. And now someone who you never thought would be in your range is there all of a sudden. So the flexibility that the 49ers have afforded themselves with the signings, the depth signings everywhere, bringing back the offensive line, it puts them in a spot where they can do anything, anything. And I think that's really what's exciting about it. Do you have to trade up? I don't I don't know because I don't know what the board's going to look like. But you have to keep yourself flexible in case somebody falls into your range and you're like, I never thought he was going to get here. We've got to go get him right now um, as opposed to just sitting and waiting and just saying, well, we know how the board's going to play out. Very rarely does the draft end up the way that anybody believes it will. Yeah, and if they stick at 31, they kind of are at the mercy of the board in front of them. And I think there's going to be a really good player at 31 if they stay there. But it just might not be the position they want it to be or the player they want it to be, and they have to be prepared to make that pick of picking the best guy, which goes back to the the best player available thing. And I hope that's what they do, and they don't force it if that player is not there. And then maybe that's when you go up in the second round, maybe. And I kind of I kind of feel like that's maybe the, the play right now is, is moving up because of how expensive it could be. Now, I talked about how they've missed. Like, how, how confident are we that they're going to nail pick 94, right? Late third round pick? Just go up and get Fuaga. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. if it costs the third round pick, if you can yeah. go up to pick twenty one and he's still there, or something like that. If if a third rounder is enough to do that, go up to. Uh, I, I can totally see that. But maybe the best strategy is going to be staying at thirty one, allowing yourself to draft whatever the best player that falls to you is, and then going up in round two to attack the player that you want that best fits your team there for a need and i think the 49ers could get up a nice a nice bit in the second round and get that sort of a player and so i'm thinking of like if if you like jordan morgan in round one wouldn't it be even better if you got chop robinson in round one and then you trade up and got jordan morgan in round two right or kingsley suamata in round two and you got kool-aid in round one or um you know cooper DeGene, you know pick your favorite player that could kind of slide in 31 and then go attack that that last offensive lineman that you like maybe in round two. And I wouldn't mind even if staying pat at, at round one and round two and going up in round three and being in the top 75 picks or so, because I think that really is the strength of this draft. Um, because, you know, I, I think this is one of the weaker day threes and, and one of the stronger top 75s we've seen in a while. And and maybe it would behoove the 49ers to try to get up and, and just strike three times in the top 75 if they could. But... I think you got to go upward at some point and maybe even go back before you go up. So maybe you drop back to pick 37 and whoever's comes up to get Michael Penix or Bo Nix or whatever it is at the end of round one. And then you got an extra pick to use to package to get up. And then you go boom, boom in round two or something like that. I don't know. I, I could see that happening. There, this could go a number of ways. And I'm just excited guys that the 49ers have a first round pick. And the 49ers have a second round pick. Like, this is pretty amazing. They, they actually have an opportunity to get somebody who could be a difference making player for them early in the draft. And we haven't we haven't seen that in a while. Yeah, sick of looking at all these guys hoping that they'll they'll be around in the third round. Like, you know, like the, last the, year was brutal trying was brutal. to scout prospects for the draft and figure out which way they could go. And yes. it's funny because I watched Jair Brown. I said, Ooh, 49ers are gonna like this guy, Jair Brown Croc. And Croc on Locked On 49ers, he never got around to watching Jair Brown before the draft. And then the Niners took him. I was like, ah, see, I told you, Croc, you should have watched Jair Brown. That was, that was my guy. And then we went back and we watched him. And, you know, it was like, eh, his scouting report is a lot like Talano Hufanga. And the Same 49ers like those types of players. And so that I trust John Lynch when it comes to safeties. That's for sure. Is there a, a, a non – we've talked so much about offensive linemen. What about non-offensive linemen? Anybody you like? Darius Robinson uh, from Missouri. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think there's your – I mean, again, if we're, we're talking about this team building from the trenches. Um, you know they're absolutely going to address a defensive line. Um, you know, again, 
I think to your point about gross models is somebody who's like an Omenihu who can rush outside, go, in, go inside, right? Like that, that really works. Leonard Floyd seems to be a one or two year guy. I think they're kind of telling you that they're not putting their eggs all in the Drake Jackson basket. Also, um, that's something that isn't going along the way that they will, that they wanted. So yeah, I like Darius Robinson from Missouri. I think he's really good. Chop, Chop is really, really interesting, Brian, because he starts to, he starts to give me the same sort of vibes at times with Mims because I can see it. And I see the burst, and then you don't have the production. And then you have the the outrageous, you know, the outrageous combine um, numbers and everything. But can you will they be able to to look at a guy like Chop who has all the physical gifts, has looks like a guy who can get off the ball right away? Will they be able to say no to that, even though he has a range of outcomes that you know it's it's a little bit more boomer bust? But I think Darius Robinson is the guy that I like the most. I was going to say the same thing. Right. I, I think he, he definitely fits like what the what the 49ers have typically liked in edge rushers. I think another guy that, you know, is getting a lot of buzz the closer we get is uh, Disa Isaac. Um, we know the 49ers love their Penn State guys, so that could make a lot of sense for them too. And I like Austin Booker as well. He was someone who at the Senior Bowl, you know, I, I think definitely uh, increased his buzz out there as well. So, um but those those are guys. I think Booker, someone who could they can get in, you know, maybe day two. So uh, there's a lot of talent. I think they can get in later rounds. I like Mo Kamara a lot as well. Um, someone Short they can team. get later in the draft. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting guys, and we haven't talked about linebacker yet. But I love Cedric. Cedric Gray, I think uh, he's someone who would definitely fit the mold of, you know, what the 49ers like in linebackers. There's a few, like, you know, nice linebackers, and we haven't talked enough about some of them just because, of course, we don't see it as a huge need for them, and it 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 really isn't. But, you know, I think the 49ers always like to bring in at least one via the draft. So, you know, look look out for that, I think. Booker's interesting, kind of a similar profile to Drake Jackson. It kind of fits the mold of a guy where, you know, you're, you're trying to find a, a home run edge rusher, you know, on day two that has height, weight, speed, and maybe he's missing a little something in development and see if he can get there. And, you know, we haven't seen that yet from, from Drake Jackson. So maybe they're just tired of waiting for that and they're going to go D line again in round one. So uh, we'll see. And again, like you're at the mercy of the board and who's going to fall. Invader 49er asked this question about the trades, guys. Here's the offer. It comes in. You call 21 is the Miami Dolphins. And you say, hey, we want to come up here. And they say, all right, 31, 94, and 135. That's your third and fourth round picks this year. This, that's the later fourth round pick. 49ers have three fourth rounders. Third and a fourth to get from 31 to 21. You say yes, and who are you taking? I say yes, and it's for Kool Aid. Mm. I mean, like I, I, I do it, and and it's for Kool Aid because then, you know, you're you're getting yourself a guy who, you know, competition competition concerns none. Um, went to Alabama. Um, literally a guy, and and just if we're going off vibes and names only, like how could you how could you not just go for a guy who's named Kool Aid? But um, I do I do like the other one too that's in there. If it is Fuaga, who is there as well yeah. too. I just I just don't know if. I don't know if he makes it past the Raiders, I don't think. But again, this is where you are. Like, this is where you are in what you think is going to happen in the draft. And I think that Kool-Aid could be there at 21, possibly. I think if it gets to that point where he gets to the Eagles, that's when you start to get nervous about him getting taken. Um, but at 21 with the Dolphins, I think they're okay with like what they have. And you can definitely move up to 21 to go get Kool-Aid for that. Dolphins have a lack of like mid round process, mid round picks too, which is why they might be looking to kind of add some picks and it could be a place to go up. 49ers obviously uh, know some folks in that building pretty well. Steph, you, you nix this trade or are you going to do it? Um, I think I would do it. Of course, if it, if who I like is there, that feels like Mims range to me. So like, you know, if, if we're, feeling like Mims is a big risk, then probably not. You could go Kool-Aid. I definitely, you know, I'm all bored with that. Uh, and, I mean, while we're talking safeties and and maybe the 49ers making a, a swing for a safety too, Tyler Newbin could be someone they, they could target um, if they want to go safety early. Um, but obviously, like, I, I think 
there there could be a tackle in that range if you know Mims isn't the only one left that I would definitely uh, try to target there. What I'm hoping in this draft is that I feel like there will be a run on wide receivers, you know, pretty early. I feel like there's been mixed reports. We get this like every year, right? Um, that there could be like six or, or seven wide receivers like taken in the first round. If there's like a mini run, maybe that can get some tackles to to kind of fall that we weren't really expecting to be in that 20 range, right? And and that can make things interesting for the 49ers because like we were talking earlier, um, hey, we, we never know how the board is going to fall. If someone who we never thought was going to be there is there, I mean, then you got to start making some calls and seeing if you can make something happen there. So, uh, yeah, I, I definitely look to explore that trade if, uh, you know, if someone I liked was there. Yeah, Fuaga's my guy, and I think he's the one player I'd probably move up for in this draft. And I, I think there is a chance that he gets somewhere close to somewhere like 21. And I say that because... We and what happens in these mock drafts because everyone needs offensive linemen. You know, you go through a mock draft and it's like, what are the needs? Offensive line, tackle, guard, whatever. But just because they need a tackle doesn't mean you just plug any tackle and it's going to fit every team, every team scheme, and what they're looking for. And all these guys are so different. Mims, Fuaga, JC Latham, they they've only played right tackle. So if a team wants a left tackle, do they want Fuaga? Are they going to go Olu Fashionu if he's there or you know obviously joe walt's probably going to go in the top 10 at some point everyone's got him at pick seven right now i've never seen a pick that deep in the draft that has everybody mocking the same player to them in my life i can't believe how uh i mean it's unanimous that joe walt goes to the titans at seven which means it, it can't possibly happen right but all these guys have some issue you know maybe your arm length is a little short maybe you're a guard um maybe you're right tackle only and a team wants a left tackle so I think there's a chance that some of these players do fall down a little bit. Uh, very unlikely that your favorite player is going to be there for the 49ers all the way down at 31. But for that reason, I do think there's a possibility for some of these guys to slip just because all these teams' boards are going to be very different and they're going to be looking for di very different things. And I do think Fuaga fits Kyle Shanahan to a T. Like, just awesome run blocker. The tape is so fun to watch. He doesn't care as much about pass blocking. Fuaga's pretty good there, but if there was a weakness, it's maybe that. His arms, again, shorter. It's in the 33-inch range. That's why some teams might look at him at guard, which is why some teams might go a different direction and, and let him fall a couple of picks. So that's that's probably the one for me. Ideally, though, I would not move up very far in round one. And I've been kind of eyeing one of those fourth-round picks. If it, if, it, if it costs one-fourth, I'm good. And that one fourth can get you up even higher in round two and get even higher in round three. And so day two trade up is where I'm at right now. As far as the the player I like that's not an offensive lineman, uh, it, I, I like the Robinsons. I like Chop and Darius Robinson. I like Johnny Newton a lot. Uh, that's what makes me excited about this draft because you do a mock, like one of these players is going to fall. There's going to be a really good player at 31. He just not, might not be the right position for the 49ers. Which is why, man, if you get chopped and then come back up for a tackle, dude, I'm, I'm all about that. Uh, I like the idea of trading up in, on day two. That's that's my strategy today. Ask me again tomorrow. I don't know. It it might look a lot different at that point. Um, oh, I was going to get into the chat here a little bit more before I let you guys go. Saints trading up for Fuaga. So that's another one. So the Saints I need a left tackle. I think Fashion was their guy at 14. And... Um, we're not trading Ayuk, right? All right. So I'm glad you said that because we're literally <laughs> we're we're literally got to talk about wide receiver because if it's not him that's moving, it's Debo Samuel, right? And like it feels like there's a there's a there's a parting of ways that's about to happen with one of these guys, right? And Xavier Leggett is the guy that everybody is kind of now saying like he fits exactly that. He kind of looks like Ayuk more to me than he does Debo, if you ask me. Like in the way that he gets himself open, not exactly like straight line speed, but Play speed is a lot better. So Leggett is going to be somebody that's going to be around probably early second, right? Because it feels like you've got this, this end part where we believe that the Kansas City Chiefs are going to be all in on a wide receiver, probably like Ladd McConkey. Um, if they want speed, Xavier Worthy, those will be the guys that are going to be there. But Leggett feels like a guy that if you can identify him and get him in the second round, then that makes that decision of whatever you have to do next season with with Debo Samuel or or Brandon Ayuk, if he's going to play on the fifth, which I doubt, you know, I think he comes back ultimately. I, I think they find a way to get the extension done. But 
when you're talking about kicking the can down the road and now you're going to have to pay the quarterback, there's going to be tough decisions that have to be made. So I think I think we have to talk about wide receiver in this draft because it does feel like there is a breakup coming with Debo Samuel more than there is Brandon Ayuk, in my opinion. Give me I've Javon been that Baker. Along. Give me Javon Baker <laughs> okay. in later rounds. I, I yeah. like Leggett's cool. Um, but I, I feel like the 49ers could get some great value later in the draft with the wide receivers. Like I think it's it, it's sneakily deep, right? Like everyone's talking about these, you know, prospects that could go in the first two rounds for the wide receivers, and they're nice. But I think there's some sneaky guys later, and Javon Baker's one of those guys. And I feel like he'd be a great uh number two uh when you know Debo Samuel uh you know, uh, moves on, uh, from the 49ers. And, you know, I, I think it'd be a great fit. He's a dog. That's been my plan all along for the 49ers is the re up. I this off season trade Debo next off season, you get one more year with them together. And uh, I think it's the max you can ask for. And both contracts don't hit at the same time. I just think it makes too much sense. I younger, going to age better than than Debo Samuel we've seen how the, you know the kind of pounding he takes and you could even use like I you could sort of start playing more of the Z spot and you start scheming more things up for him and, and treating him more like a true number one as well instead of sort of the backside wide receiver on a lot of plays um as far as the question what's the lowest pick you'd take I, you know, I would say like pick 20 17 or 20 if he gets traded in this draft uh, basically once in fact, you know, that pick 21 again, once the Dolphins are on the clock again, I use, I use staying, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And I, I doubt he gets moved, but maybe Kyle just loves Debo so much. And, you know, maybe there's a little bit of that doghouse scent still on Ayuk for whatever reason. Uh, they didn't like him early on. If there's still something there where they're like, you know, we, do, we don't trust him as much and we're willing to take this and not pay him and, and go forward. I could see it. And that's kind of like the dark horse, like, everyone's eyes pop out of their head move is like lad mcconkey the 49ers at 31 everyone's like oh my god wait what what's going oh, on right I mean, now? you know i mean like, that's he's, nice he's a yeah. route runner man he's a route runner man i love I mcconkey don't get me wrong yeah um but that <laughs> i mean buckle up because we always there's so much group think we we think we know what's going on and it, it's gonna be nuts man so i can't wait to see how the 49ers shock the hell out of us and, and you know probably half the teams in the league shocked the hell out of us two weeks from tonight. I think if a pick 31, the 49ers do not se select an offensive lineman, you are going to see backlash that is so heavy because everything is you need lineman, 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 but it goes back to need best player available. What's there? Can you identify a guy on the back end? Like that is going to be the best part. And I, for one, I sign me up for the chaos. Let's let's do this because no matter it, like again, like when when I asked John Lynch at the combine about best player available in need, he said we just like drafting good football players, and we don't we don't care about like what other people think of them in terms of value. And I'm just like, well, we kind of knew that because there's many times <laughs> where we're looking, we're like, wait, that's a little bit early. Like even Aaron Banks, that's a little early. So I think at the same time, while we believe that we have a handle on what this team needs and we do, you know, but that doesn't mean that the team is going to approach it the way that we think they are. And I, I guarantee you, if they don't take a, a lineman at 31, the backlash is going to be so strong. I, I just, I can't, uh, I, I can't wait. I can't wait for it either. Uh, by the way, good point in the chat. Xavier worthy could be that, that McConkey, AD Mitchell, the Texas connection, Kyle's alma mater. There was some report. I don't even remember if it was, substantial report or not or where it came from but i saw oh he's been sniffing around the university of texas a lot kyle always has one really insanely fast receiver on his roster too but that he never uses hi danny so, gray wouldn't that be wouldn't that be like ultimate kyle to draft xavier worthy and then he's like the fourth wide receiver on the 49ers roster sounds on brand <laughs> uh all right good stuff thanks everybody for joining us here on Another episode of OT with BP. Seeing everybody jump in live. Seeing a lot. We have 500 folks in here right now. This is this is fun. Appreciate Jason Aponte at Jason Aponte. Two is it two one zero three two three zero one? 
two two one oh three underscore um yeah like uh, it's, it's 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 burner vibes it's supposed to throw people off the the numbers are some trash ass yankees reference right is that what it is no 21 oh. is roberto 21 is roberto clemente oh that's not and, trash. Okay. and and three um is my favorite number um alan iverson a lot of a lot of other great players that wore three not babe ruth so yeah okay not babe ruth all right yeah i'll get down with uh with that so that's cool okay i like your i like the number that you have on there that you should have got rid of a long time ago uh, <laughs> and sprint right option pod steph sanchez steph 49k steph before you go can you tell us what what uh nick bosa is going to say about the offensive tackle the 49ers draft to pick 31 well he better get ready to you know go up against me in in camp because i don't plan to miss it this time <laughs> Fantastic and topical, nailing it. Oh, I love that. For all the best, Nick Bosa and uh, 49ers coverage, go to the 49K pod and Steph 49K on Twitter. Steph, Jason, appreciate you joining me. Appreciate to everybody uh, that jumping in the live chat as well. Make sure you subscribe to the new channel here. Croc and I are going to be live during the draft. First round on this channel, second round on Croc's channel. Probably come back on this channel. Of course, we're going to be doing Locked On 49ers every day, breaking down the prospects from the draft before, after, all year long. Peacock and Williamson NFL podcast, breaking down the entire league daily as well on the Locked On Podcast Network. So appreciate you all. Subscribe up, and we'll see you next time.